Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Guys of Magic. This is Hunter, Steven, David, Shane. Say what up, boys. Yo, what's going on? Mm, yellow. What's up, nerds? We are back doing another Commander Grades video, this time taking a look at all of the legendary creatures from the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. That's right. Today's video, we are talking about just the monocolor legendaries that can be potential commanders. If you're new here, what this video is, is we like to discuss these as potential commanders, give them a grade at the end, and then have an average grade about what we think about these. So let's go ahead and start it off with the white one. This is Osier Talk Debus Foundation. It is four and two white for a 6-6 six, six legendary creature god. It's got vigilance, and it says if one or more creature tokens would be created under your control, three times that many of those tokens are created instead. And when Osier Talk dies, return it to the battlefield tapped and transformed under its owner's control. When it is transformed, it turns into Temple of Civilization, which is a land that can tap for a white, or you can pay two in a white, tap it, transform Temple of Civilization, activate only if you attacked with three or more creatures this turn, and only as a sorcery. How do we feel about Osier Talk Deepest Foundation, David? I really don't know if we want to start off with me for this card. I'll go. Mixed. I feel mixed. Because I feel like I like Mondrak, and this is like a bigger Mondrak, right? But it's more expensive. And I, I think, though, it has a good thing going for it with the land that it's probably easier to transform back. So that's probably a plus. But I don't know. It just seems like this is kind of a win more card that costs six. Kind of scary. Well, here's the thing about you saying it's like Mondrak. The only downside in comparative to Mondrak is Mondrak hits all tokens where this just makes creatures. Yeah, and I think that might be its negativity as well. Like Mondrak was more flexible. And was that, did we, did we like Mondrak as a commander? I don't even remember. Yes. Yes, we did. We did. The yeah. issue here, if I'm honest with you, is that Mondrag is A, cheaper, B, hits all tokens, and C, the biggest thing, in my opinion, you can sacrifice those things to give it indestructible. True. That's where this card is lacking, but I do enjoy this card. You know, I deferred my like response, assuming that you guys were going to like jump on the love train for this card. And I got to say, the reason why I, dec I decided to like bite my tongue there at the very beginning is because of all of the points you guys just brought up. I oh. just I, I feel like we got another legendary creature in Mondrak that does this exact same thing, but actually just does it better. And if you're looking between the two of these, I don't know why I would want to play this one over that. Because you're yeah, making triple. It. Yeah, but creatures. Here is the thing, though, is that you're making triple, but it's also a less protected creature. It has the downside of potentially being a land. Um, and then also on top of that, like it, it's two mana more expensive. Mondrak is going to be so much more impactful over the course of the game just because it comes in earlier. Yeah, but you don't have to make it turn to the land. You can put it back in the command zone. Yeah, okay, but here, here is my point, though, is that this one's upside is that it can be a land. In the case that it dies, Mondrak's upside is they try to target it with destruction removal, and then boom, it's just indestructible. Yeah, that's true. Mondrak is a lot better than Ogre Talk. Um, I don't know, though. The triple the amount of creatures is a nuts effect. And, and so is double the amount of creatures, though. And I just don't think that the like extra two mana here and less flexibility is worth that extra two mana. Yeah, I really do think that this would be like a really cool support card in like other mono white decks, like maybe Adeline. I think Adeline would have a field day with this, or even you know things like you know uh, Ishin. If you those little combat triggers making those little tokens, you know what I mean. I think this would be really fun. Yeah, it's definitely a good support piece. I think um, an expensive support piece too. But let's go ahead and move on to the grades. Ogre Talk for me uh, is going to get a D, just because I think. It does a really cool thing, but as we've said, Mondrak just does it a little better. I am 100% not in agreement on that grade, in all honesty. Um, this is not a card that I'm super high on. However, at the same time, this is still a really big effect. It's a pretty decent-sized body. If you're playing in Mono White and you're playing not necessarily at the highest power, this card can be quite a bit of fun. I'm actually still going to give this a B. I'm sorry, did you say B? Yeah, as, as in, in boy. As in, wow. Be it, yeah, B as in boy. This is a card that still has the ability to take over a board relatively quickly. It's just kind of expensive. Well, I'm not that high and I'm not that low. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and give this a C. I do understand the points on being able to take over the board. I just, with this being susceptible to removal that's destroying and being exiled, this I can't do it. Not for six mana. Right there with you, Steven. I'm more in the middle of the road. 
My gut said C. I'm sticking with C. Ojer Tuck, Deepest Foundation, gets the average grade of a C. And that's the only white creature, so let's move on to the blue ones. First up, Pakal Pakal, first among equals. It is two and a blue for a 1-5 legendary creature human advisor. It says, at the beginning of each player's end step, if an artifact enter the battlefield under your control this turn, look at the top two cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the other into your graveyard. How do we feel, Steven? I feel like this is pretty fun. Uh, I think that it's just kind of tough to build around because you really have to build a blue artifact deck to a certain extent, and you really have to play around with Flash. I think that's really the only tough part about this. Otherwise, it is a pretty interesting card. You know, it sucks this is mono blue because if you could have access to white for like Smothering Tithe to get that treasure token on other people's turns, I think that'd be really fun. That's where I'm kind of at with this card. I agree with you there for Smothering Tithe. It would be very easy to make that trigger every single turn. <laughs> but I think the mono blue of this kind of, in, at least in my opinion, limits it. So it's unfortunate. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure there are avenues, obviously, and other tokens and other artifact ways. I just, I just don't play it that often, so it doesn't come to my mind. I mean, mechanized production. Yeah, there you go. That's that's on your own turn, though. I'm just 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 to enable at least it happening every single turn. That's one card that can go in here. I mean, you're also going to be throwing in cards like Shimmer Mirror, uh, Liberator Urzis, Battle Thopter, probably Leyline of Anticipation. So, like, there's a lot of cards that you can put into this mono blue deck that makes your artifacts have flash. It's true as well. That'd be important. Uh, but let's move on to the grades. I think we're all on the kind of the same page here. What are we giving it, David? Uh, I'm going to give it a C. I actually think it's kind of middle of the road and relatively low impact, but there is some stuff that you can do here, and I love the fact that it's cheap. I'm right there with you, dude. I'm going to give it a C. I'm joined with both of you. This is a C for me as well. Yeah, I when I saw this card, I got really excited because I, I love being able to filter through my deck, but... I think this is just going to require a lot of pieces, and you just got to kind of hope that you get them in your hand. So I'm going to give this a C as well. All right. Pakal, Pakal, first among equals, gets the average grade of a C. Should get an A just for the name. <clears throat> Next up, Malcolm, Alluring Scoundrel. It's one in a blue for a 2-1 legendary creature, Siren Pirate. It's got flash. It's got flying. It says whenever it deals combat damage to a player, put a chorus counter on it. Draw a card, then discard a card. If there are four or more chorus counters on Malcolm, you may cast the discarded card without paying its mana cost. I want to mm. like this card a lot, and I do, except I like it a lot in not EDH and in standard instead. I feel like he just kind of said what was in my head. Yeah, this, is, this seems like a standard card. I mean, free spells it. are never bad. No, and I said this when we first saw the spoiler of this card. Blue is all about proliferating. So if you can get that one chorus onto this card, then boom, there you go. Now you can just go ahead, get all four of those chorus counters, and then start swinging in, give this unblockable just to get that, and just cast stuff for free that you're discarding. Seems pretty decent. It does seem easier to do the, to get the triggers on it in EDH than standard. So it's a little off of what you said, Hunter, but yeah, I don't know. I just, it needs to be, very impactful to be your commander, and I'm hoping this would be impactful. This just kind of filters your hand. I don't think that you're actually going to be taking advantage of that final ability to be able to cast those things very often. So it's kind of a cool effect in that just like it's helping you to craft a better hand, but I don't know if I want my commander to do that. I just think this is too low impact. I don't, I don't know if this is low impact. I just think this is one of those commanders where... You know, we see the play coming, and I think that's where this card is going to kind of suck a little bit. I think that Magic has a lot of ways, whether it's colorless or in mono blue, to play with the top of your library. And I think that just being able to get to those four chorus counters, it's going to get aggressive. And I just think this is going to be something that just gets removed on the spot. Uh, just really, I mean, but then again, it's mono blue, baby. You got tons of protection. So, I mean, I, you know, I think that's pretty viable. I agree with you there. And you got Flash, so you don't need to put this out immediately, even though you'd probably want to get out early, just get those course counters quickly. And luckily, we are at two mana for a commander, which is very cheap. Yep. Plus, as we've seen with the previous sets and in blue in general, proliferation is not a joke. 
But let's move on to the grade for Malcolm. I'm actually going to give it a C. I'm still middle of the road here. I'm going to jump up to a B. Uh, I think this is pretty strong. And for Mono Blue, I think this could be a little aggressive. As a blue player, I'm still going to be middle of the road, I think. I'm going to give it a C. And as much as I want to like this card, I just can't bring myself to it. Uh, I'm going to give this a D. Malcolm, a luring scoundrel, gets the average grade of a C. Next up, Ozier, Pak Patik, Deepest Epoch. It's 2-2 two and two blue for a 4-3 legendary creature god. It's got flying. It says, whenever you cast an instant spell from your hand, it gains rebound. If you forgot what that means, it means excellent. As it resolves, at the beginning of your next upkeep, you may cast it from exile without paying its mana cost. And whenever Ozier, Pak Patik, dies, return it to the battlefield tapped and transformed under its owner's control with three time counters on it. When it's transformed, it turns into the Temple of Cyclical Time, which is a land that can tap for a blue, and it also removes a time counter from the Temple of Cyclical Time. It's got another ability you can pay two and a blue, tap it, transform, Temple of Cyclical Time, activate only if it has no time counters on it, and only as a sorcery. I love this card so much. I want I to know. love it so much, dude. I, I want to love it too, and the thing that is really annoying is that a lot of the times you want instant spells that are surprises. So I feel like being able to rebound only instants hurts this card so much. I completely agree with you on that one. I feel like if you are going to be playing mono blue, you're probably going to be packing in like quite a bit of like counter spells, which basically don't do anything with this commander. So that's going to eat up a pretty decent amount of like your removal and control package. And I don't know, just like telegraphing what you're going to do is never a good thing in Magic. So although it does have the ability for your like opponents to be stifled a little bit, they're just going to be able to play around this commander. Um, and if you are trying to do some things to progress your own board state with those instants, chances are, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I just look at it like this, this reads so much better than what it plays. Dude, it, it reads so much better. I 100% agree. If I've, lear if I've learned anything from the 10th Doctor, Showing everyone what you're going to do the next turn is not a good idea because everyone's just going to target you. And if you get something good, they're like, well, well you're not going to do that again. And like, the, I want to love this card so much. I think David and I talked about it a lot when it first was revealed and I was super high on it. And it's just it does really cool things, I will admit. And this will be a fun commander. Like, I might even still try this. It just I don't think I'm going to get much success with it. See, I feel like if you're playing this, I feel like this is just a worse version of Lear, Disciple of the Deep. That just gives all of your sorceries and instants flashback from the graveyard. It's just it it's is better to me. I gotta pay for that, but yeah. That is also the one that um makes all like, every spell uncounterable, correct? Yeah. Disciple of the Drown, sorry. What do you think, Steven? I think this card's nuts, man. Uh I, I just view this as a card to Basically, get through your deck as fast as possible and gets you to your win condition. And obviously, I am talking about this as a combo player. And I, that's how I see this deck being played. I actually think there's a lot of cards from Doctor Who that are going to be able to help us out, especially with us seeing on the backside of the land where this says remove a time counter. I think the clock spinning card from Doctor Who and then also the, you know, the wibbly wobbly timey wimey. I, I think that this is going to be a great deck. I, I think. I just I understand your points on this, but this is nuts, and you can play it in so many different ways. I just I, I really do enjoy this card. I could literally go on about multiple cards on this, so I, I don't want to obviously you know get too deep into it. But th this is a great card. Fox spinning is a reprint, by the way. But I get I get what you're saying. Jar is time bug real good for this card too. Real quick, because I feel like we're diving down a rabbit hole for time mechanics. The front half of the card doesn't care about time counters at all. I mean, sure. I understand that it doesn't care about time counters at all. I'm just saying the back, if you do get to that point. I'm just saying those are cards you can throw in. But, like, would you want to throw those cards in? Because then that's going to eat up all the other cards that are actually going to do things that are impactful for your deck. I don't, I don't think that throwing those cards in will, will ruin this deck at all. I think having a couple cards to remove time counters, especially with the fact that, you know, if you are going to be targeted for removal or, as you and I know, especially when we play a ton of commander games, there's so much like board wipes. So I think just having those there as an option to kind of get you back in a little bit faster will get you to that point. I, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a hindrance at all. But that that's kind of my point too, is like, would I rather have Joyra's time bug or just like 
another counter spell. That way the board wipe just doesn't resolve and I don't have to worry about the suspend mechanic. I don't really think you need too many card. counters in this. I'll be honest with you. I, I think that you kind of want board wipes in Magic because especially if your other opponents are building large board states and you're kind of trying to filter through your deck because I don't really think you're playing a ton of creatures in this deck. I think you're just trying to like get a bunch of instants out, buy them back, or you know, not saying buy back, I'm sorry, but like rebound them and play them again and again and again. I think that this is going to be just a, a massive nuisance on the board. Let's move on to the grade. Steven, you seem really high on this card. What is your grade? I mean, just for the simple fact that it is really good, and I think that it'll be a, a, a nuisance. I'm just going to put this at a B, and it's a super high B in my opinion. I think this could be a really good A, but I, I just I don't want to put it there. I'm not that high. I'm still sticking in the middle of the road. Once again, this is a C. The blue player in me wants to give us a B, so I'm going to give it a B. See, this is why I love we, how we do these videos. We get some discussion back and forth about like our different thoughts and opinions on this card. Um, ultimately, I do still kind of agree more so on Hunter's side. I, I'm going to go with a C on this card. Ogier Pakpatik is going to get the average grade of a B. That's going to do it for all the blue cards. Time to move on to the black ones. This first one, Alklazot's Deepest Betrayal. It's three and two black for a 4-4 four, four legendary creature Bat God. It's got flying and lifelink. It says whenever it attacks, each opponent discards a card. For each opponent who can't, you draw a card. And whenever an opponent discards a land card, create a 1-1 one, one black bat creature token with flying. And when Aklazots dies, return it to the battlefield tapped and transformed under its owner's control. It transforms into Temple of the Dead. It can tap for a black, or you can pay two and a black, tap it, transform Temple of the Dead, activate only if a player has one or fewer cards in hand, and only as a sorcery. So this this is a discard commander, right, Dave? This is... I, I mean, yes, I guess you would classify this as a discard commander. This I'm just going to go be very upfront here. Uh, this is hands down my least favorite of the entire cycle. Of the god cycle? Yeah. He's a false god anyways. He is. He's he's not one of the actual like real gods. He's a uh, a usurper, right? Yeah. He killed the ancient god. I don't know. It's it's a cool card for what it is. I mean, I like the flying and lifelink. I don't like five mana in a mono color. Uh, that's starting to kind of press. Also, you have to be attacking for this to do really a whole lot of anything, and discarding just one card isn't much. And then the payoff here is that sometimes you make some bats, and I don't think that's very good either. So I'm not actually super impressed with anything about the front half of this card, and I think out of all of the, uh, well, all the cards in this, like, God Cycle, this one might be the most difficult to transform back from the land. We also the bats aren't the most impactful. I think what it has going for it at least is that since this does need to attack, giving it that flying evasion. Uh, it's not very often that you run up against something with a ton of flyers in EDH. Would, you might have a couple here or there, so this hopefully won't just be swinging into death, so you should be able to get in and maybe have someone discard a card. If not, you draw cards. Like That first part, at least, seems okay-ish to me at best, but yeah, the back, I agree with you, David. It's probably the the hardest one here to flip back to a commander, so you probably don't want to be turning this into a land very often. I actually like this card a lot. Um, I like how it's an attack trigger, not a combat damage trigger. That's really cool. And it's card draw. So if you're just throwing in a whole bunch of discard effects into your deck, which you should with this card, someone's going to have no cards in hand. When you swing in, you're drawing a card for everyone that doesn't have any cards. That's fantastic. And if they're discarding a land because they don't want to get through other stuff, that's just extra fodder for if you want to sack them to something else. I don't know. An astronaut's altar to get more mana for something. I think it's a pretty good card. This card's so good. I really do love this card with a lot of my heart. I won't lie to you. I just... It, the only thing I hate about this card is obviously when you build this, and this is the only thing I'll agree with... I'll disagree with David about. This is 100% a discard deck. You are literally just pumping your deck filled with a bunch of stuff to remove cards from your opponent's hands. And I think that exactly like you said, Hunter, this is a card draw outlet for you as well. I, this card is great. I, again, just like the other god, I can go into a rabbit hole and I don't want to go too far into it. Uh, it, it this is just a great card. I think it's unfortunate yeah. because if it is a straight discard card, which it, it, I agree it is, like I, 
why not just play a better one? Like, why not just play tier grid? Like, a lot yeah. of hate comes from tier grid, and, and I think this could be just like if you don't want to get that hate, you run this instead. But this one also makes each opponent discard a card every time it swings. So I think that this is actually going to be generating a significant amount of hate here as well. Now, yeah, it's not as impactful as something like Tier Grid. It's not just going to be like the card that needs to die immediately or the game is just like going to go south. But I still think that this is going to eat a surprisingly large amount of removal. And starting at five mana, I, I do think that this game, it, it's going to creep up really fast. Well, let's move on to the grids. I'm actually really high on this card. So I'm going to give it a B. Yeah, I'm right there with you, man. This is a B for me as well. I'll acknowledge that it's a good card, but I'm still going to be middle of the road. Give it a C. And uh, I'm going to stick true to my original thoughts on this. This is my least favorite of the entire cycle, and I just don't know how playable this one is. Uh, I'm going to give this a D. Aklazot's Deepest Betrayal gets the average grade of a C. That was the only black card. Moving on to the red ones. We have Breaches is back. This is Breaches, Eager Pillager, two and a red for a 3-3 legendary creature, Goblin Pirate. It's got First Strike and says, whenever a pirate you control attacks, choose one that hasn't been chosen this turn. You can create a treasure token, or target creature can't block this turn, or exile the top card of your library. You may play it this turn. What do you think, Shane? I mean, it's going to be a fun little pirate deck getting all three of those every turn seems good so let's get ability to get some damage in make some treasure you get to run i mean I, I, give me the numbers on how many good red pirates are there there are 41 pirates that are just mono red all right well out of those hopefully some are playable when i think of mono red i probably don't think of this card right away but it might just be a fun shenanigans deck yeah, you know there's... dockside's a pirate <laughs> dockside yeah. ragavan those are pretty good pirates those, those are some pretty good pirates. You know what? Those are going in the deck. <laughs> I think there's some fun to be had with this card, but I think that there's not quite enough like pirate support and just mono red to make this like really kick. And then even in the case that this thing is actually doing all three of those modes, I don't think you're going to be able to pull that off like all the time. I think it's a cool card. Um, and I like the flexibility of it. I just don't think this is something that's like super impactful right now. Yeah, I think I think the flexibility of choose one that hasn't been chosen is unfortunate. Like if it was choose three, say mode could be chosen more than once. I think that would make it so much better. I mean, yeah, duh. Um, but yeah, it's just it's okay. I mean, so here's the thing about this card, right? I think this would actually be really fun. I just don't see this as a super strong or competitive deck. I think this is going to be more of a kind of like bring it to the table, have some fun with your pirates kind of deck. And I think that's that's perfectly OK. It's perfectly OK. Yeah. Shenanigans. Yeah. Let's move on to the grades. I'm giving breaches. I'm going to give it a D. Well, that's not very fun. I'm going to give it a C. I was going to give it a C, too. Well, you know what? I'm going to give it a C as well. Wow. Breaches Eager Pillager is the average grade of a C. Moving on to Inti, Seneschal of the Sun. It's one and a red for a 2 2 legendary creature, Human Knight. It says, whenever you attack, you may discard a card. When you do, put a plus one plus one counter on target attacking creature. It gains trample until end of turn. It also says, whenever you discard one or more cards, X on the top card of your library, you may play that card until your next end step. Hmm. A lot of filtering. It really is. I think this card was, when it was spoiled, I was really high on it, but I was high on it for a standard where I think it'll make a much bigger splash. Uh, it, I mean, it could do something as a commander because you are going to be pumping up whatever else you attack with, and maybe you don't attack with this, and it also is just for two, so it's, if it does die, it comes back. Like So there, there are applications there, but I think that this was way more splashy than standard. How often are you going to attack with this? Probably not ever, right? Yeah, unless it's big. I don't know. Yeah, probably not. You're just running big, giant beaters in mono red? Make them have trample. Yeah, you know, gains trample. To play devil's advocate here, and I'm not saying that that's something that I would probably do, but like, this is a two drop, and it can give itself that plus one, plus one, and trample. Like, if you do get this thing down early enough, this can be its its target for the plus one, plus one, so it does start swinging in. Yeah, well, that's why I understand I that. standard's so good. But... I'll tell you something that's really bad about this card, though. Tell me. You are not gaining 
any cards into your hand that you can discard to make this trigger. That's pretty you're, bad. You're going to be playing Hellbent, dude. I don't know. I mean, like that is a strategy, and this is a potential commander for it, but I'm kind of in agreement with what you guys have already mentioned, that this is a card that I think has much bigger implications in other formats. It's a whole lot of meh here. <laughs> and a dinosaur. <laughs> well, let's move on to the grades, then. Steven, what do you give an NT? I'm going to give this a D. I think it can be fun. I just, I'm not a big fan of it. I agree with you. I think NT is also a D. Yeah, my gut said to give it a D. Standard, much better, I think, but EDHD. Here we go, boys. I think this is it. This is the time of the video where we are all in a grants. This card is a D. NT is getting the average grade of a D. Moving on to Osher Axonil, Deepest Might. It's two and two red for a four forward legendary creature god. It's got Trample. It says, if a red source you control would deal an amount of non-combat damage less than Osher Axonil's power to an opponent, that source deals damage equal to Osher Axonil's power instead. When Osher Axonil dies, return it to the battlefield tapped and transformed under its owner's control. When it is transformed, it turns into Temple of Power. It is a land that can tap for a red. It has another ability to pay two and a red. Tap it, transform Temple of Power. Activate only if red sources you controlled dealt four or more non-combat damage this turn and only as a sorcery. David, I believe you love this card. I do. I love this card so much. Um, any of your little pingers, which there are tons of in red, so long as this commander is in play, has they all have the ability to tap to deal for four damage. And some of them get really nutty because some of them can hit multiple times in a single turn. Um, so like, for example, if you are playing with Thermo Alchemist, um, you can tap and untap it and tap and untap it. So I think there's a lot of kind of like crazy shenanigans you can do with this card. I love the fact that it comes down relatively like early ish and that it's only four mana. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know. There are some cards that really go nuts with this. Um, things like Pyrohemia, things like uh, mana barbs, where your opponents are just going to start spiking their life totals. And the, the biggest downside I can say for this card is I do think it's going to generate a significant amount of hate. Um, but I do think that this is kind of in the same realm as something like uh, Torbren or Perforos, where this is going to be a mono red commander that if your opponents don't deal with it immediately, life totals are just going to start plummeting. Yeah, I completely agree with you. This card is absolutely insane to me. Just any non combat damage is always going to be equal to the power. Just pump this up. Put as much stuff, make it a Voltron commander, but don't even need to swing in with it. Just start hitting people for. Little tappers that deal the amount of power? That's crazy. Man, I don't know, dude. It's got a dinosaur arm. The ability's okay. <laughs> the dinosaur is awesome, dude. As the dinosaur <laughs> player, this makes that card even better. I'm just kidding. I'm just trolling David. This is the card that he fell in love with, and I had to give him shit because he didn't like my blue card. <laughs> I don't, I don't really know. Uh, I don't really know what else to say. This card is uh, really good. You guys have touched up on pretty much everything that we could talk about. All right. Well, let's move on to the grades. Osier Axonil, David, what are you giving it? You know what? I, I'm going to give it an A, but I don't know if it actually is up in that realm. I'm giving it an A because I know it is up in that realm. Yeah, it's not, David. It's a, it's a B. Yeah, you guys are a little crazy. Uh, and by you guys, I mean Shane, because this is an A. <laughs> <laughs> Osier Axonil Deepest Might gets the average grade of an A. That is all of the red cards. Moving on to the final cards. They're just the green ones. First up, Galta Stampede Tyrant. Five and three green for a 12-12 legendary creature elder dinosaur. It's got Trample. It says when it enters the battlefield, put any number of creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Big, giant dinosaurs. I love it. However... However, this what? means, However. I mean, this is this is eight mana, which means if you want his ability to go off, you're not casting your other things in your hand, which I think is a mistake. You should be casting everything that you can spend your mana on. That in itself makes this card not as good. I mean, you don't really care about casting other things if you're just going to be dumping your hand every time you play him. Yeah, but that means you're not doing anything until you get to this point. Right, he's ramping. That's what green does. 
What, Dave? You don't have to cast this guy. It says enters the battlefield. Yeah, I know, sure, but it's in your you command know. zone. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, you throw a Conjurer's Closet in this deck, and then <laughs> what is mana? What is mana? It's a great just, question. This is just a win more card in the command zone, dude. I don't like it. I think it's a great piece to throw into a deck, and sure. specifically dinosaurs. But yeah, I don't think this is actually a good commander. I'm sorry, Galta. I love you. Holy cow. Am I going to be the one who argues that the mono green dinosaur is actually pretty solid? Sure. Yeah, I don't I don't understand why we're... I, I don't get this, David. Dude, you guys are ridiculous. This is going to go off once, maybe twice, and then you're just going to dump your hand and have nothing to do and then get board wiped and then be in top deck mode. How, how are what you? Mean, be... What do you mean you're going to be empty handed? You you mean there's not cards in green that lets you draw whenever power four or greater come into the battlefield? Or just okay. like whenever another creature enters the battlefield. Like green You're... has so many good creature based draw engines that like I don't <laughs> think your hand is ever gonna be empty. And if you do manage to start bouncing this, because like let's be real, it is a lot of mana, but it's mono green. So like that's probably not gonna be very difficult for you to be able to still get this thing back into play. Like if this drops. I just think you're starting to go off and just like take over a board. And I don't care if my opponents board wipe me because this is just going to throw me back into the game whenever I, I get it back into play. Oh, what? and I forgot that in green, you can actually, you know, draw cards equal to power. That's, ah, it's great. I'm going to rebuttal on everything. What is that enchantment that you can play? Spells that cast their mana. What's that spell for that enchantment? Omniscience? Called? Yeah. That card in EDH. It's like, yeah, when it, it resolves, it's broken. But what, like, you just start, if you resolve that card, you don't always have to win. You might, but it's like, that's, I'm getting the same kind of vibes here. It's like, well, it's Omniscience also doesn't have 12 power and trample. Which, I don't know. This is, <laughs> uh, like I'm saying, this is a win more card a thousand percent. Look, I'm not going to disagree with you that this is not a win more card, but I think this is a card that has the ability to take you from, like, not a participant in a game to potentially overrunning it in a single instance so like i'm still gonna put this up there i think this card can be very impactful you drop this if you have one of the many different green draw engines you draw a ton of cards off this and worst case scenario this kills your opponent in two hits with commander damage also sorry just one last thing i want to talk about on this card this also says put any number of creature cards not just dinosaurs or anything like that so hello eldrazi Yes, that's true. I mean, would you say, that, David, that Gishath also gets you from 0 to 100? No, because Gishath has to be able to attack and has the potential not to grab that many cards. It's playing off the top of your library, so there's a, there's a degree of chance with that. I think that this card actually has more upside and is a bigger body. Let's move on to the grades. David, you're high on Galta. What are you giving it? I am. I'm, I'm going to give it a B. I don't think it's quite an A range, but this is at least like a solid B for me. As the dinosaur solid. player, yeah. I'm going to be middle of the road for Galta. It's a C. Yeah. Solid C for me. Yeah, you can all suck it. This is an A. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> there is a world enchantment that gives all creatures haste and green, and that's all I got to say. Galta Stampede Tyrant is the average grade of a B. And the final card we are talking about today is Osher Kaslim, Deepest Growth. Is three and two green for a six five legendary creature god. It's got trample and says whenever it deals combat damage to a player, reveal that many cards from the top of your library. You may put a creature card and or a land card from among them onto the battlefield. Put the rest on the bottom in a random order. When Osher Kaslam dies, return it to the battlefield tapped and transformed under its owner's control. It transforms into Temple of Cultivation. It's a land that can tap for green, and has another ability to pay two and a green. Tap it. Transform Temple of Cultivation. Activate if you control ten or more permanents and only as a sorcery. How about this one, Dave? I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions, Hunter and Shane, on this card first, before Stephen and I get the opportunity to talk. I think this card is insane for standard. <laughs> for standard. I think it's going to be a new... I think this helps mono green and standard, yes. But as far as an EDH commander goes, I think it's pretty good. I mean, revealing that many cards from the top of your library and being able to just pick and choose a land 
and a creature if you see both onto the battlefield. Not only does that ramp you, that also gives you just more creatures to go ahead and swing with next turn or potentially block. I assume you're just making giant creatures in this deck. And the backside, flipping it back into this creature, so much easier. It counts itself as a permanent, so you really just need nine permanents. And they're all, and you just, they count lands, so why not? Yeah, this card's great. I don't, I don't really understand if you guys might not like it or not. Uh, just the fact. I, so here's the thing. I'm just gonna say a couple words, and it's my favorite couple words actually. Mono green Voltron. I love this card. This card is great. Ramp, 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 ramp. Put silly things on it. Make it huge. Double its power. Just murder you. Quite the words. And quite the wordsmith. Oh, that's a lot of words. That was that was way more words. <laughs> well, mono green, mono green Voltron were my three, my words, and then I went on from there. Oh, I was gonna say you had a lot of words you had to say there. Those were yeah. in parentheses. Yeah, like Black Blade Reforged or Fire Shrieker go nuts with this, man. I, I think that this card is like it's cool. However, I'm actually not super high on this one. Um it has to be able to connect to to have its ability do anything. And if your opponent does block, which they're going to be incentivized to, you're going to be revealing fewer cards from the top of your library, which is going to minimize your overall like chance of hitting something powerful or decent. I do like how it can either grab a land and or a creature. So chances are you're still going to be able to put something into play. But this is a card to me that like, if I have a 4-4 four, four and you're going to swing this at me, I'm probably actually going to block just to minimize what it is that you can look from the top of your library. And I think that's kind of where the, the Voltron aspect comes in to be able to power up this creature and, you know, just kind of like look at as many cards as possible. But I think the really cool thing is here, you know, you basically have, what is it, Ascend? Is that is that what it was back in the day? Or not uh, back in the day? Yeah, like, the reference to Ascend on the 10 permanents. Yeah. yeah, I think you just being able to get to 10 permanents, whether that's land because you're ramping really hard or including all the other things on your side of the field. So when this dies, hopefully not due to any exile effects, I mean, obviously you're able to transform this, so it'll come back tapped, but, you know, hopefully you can have little things. I mean, I know it's like a shot in the dark, but Amulet of Vigor is always a fun thing to have. Uh, but I really do think even without being able to attack, I, I think this is a super strong card, regardless of anything. Being able to look at your cards on the top of your library after pumping this, maybe 12, 15, 20 cards, swinging in for some commander damage and just putting in some fun Eldrazi or just really anything that could really hurt somebody. Well, let's move on to the grades. Steven, what are you giving Osher Kaslam? I mean, you know what? I gave Galta an A. I might as well give this an A. I'm not going that high. I am going to go down to a B because there, as much as I hate to say it, there is still that whiff potential. And that would be unfortunate if you flipped over all lands. I mean, you still get one land, but it would be sad. Or just other permanents. I think you're the only person here that could flip into six lands. <laughs> yeah, Maybe you could... I've done it before with Gishath. You, you still get the land, though. You get the land. Let, okay, well, if you flip over artifacts, sorceries, and instants, and then you're really sad. You know, that would be you. That would be me. I think I'm middle of the road on this card. I think I'm extremely high on this in standard. I'm going to give it a C. We have some very mixed thoughts on this card. Um, I'm going to give this a B, even with me talking kind of like down about the card. This is still a powerhouse if this engine gets going. Osher Kaslam, deepest growth, gets the average grade of a B. And that is going to do it for today. That is all the monocolor legendaries from the brand new set, The Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Comment down below. Did you agree with our grades? Maybe you disagreed with our grades. Always interested in hearing what we might have missed. Or maybe that we were on point with something. Like this video if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Check the description for links to our social media accounts. That's Instagram, X, and TikTok, at Guys of Magic for each one. Also, in the description, you will see a link to our Patreon. If you wanted to support us more than you already are just by watching this video, check that link because we have some bonus content, some giveaways, our Discord server, a bunch of extra goodies right there on our Patreon. And until the next video, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Peace. Later. Goodbye. Bye-bye.